Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Pastor Roy. We're going through the book of Daniel, and I'm going to pray, and we'll get into this. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, truly we are grateful for the opportunity to gather together just to be around like-minded people, but truly we're excited to learn and grow in the truths that you have for us, Lord. So we pray for our time. We pray as we, we enter into this time that we truly we would learn, we would see what you have, but we'd be able to apply it to our lives, Lord. So we pray that our hearts and our minds would be rightfully aligned as we've been through busy days and chaotic things, that we could focus on the truths that you have for us, Lord. So we thank you for that. We thank you for your word that you give us that helps us to shape us, Lord. And truly, we pray that we would have the wisdom to have the right convictions, to stand in a culture of compromise that's around us, Lord. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. All right, so we're in Daniel. We've been traveling through Daniel. We're coming to the end of Daniel, kind of wrapping up here. We're in the last vision uh, to get us caught up with that. The first half of the book of Daniel is written as Daniel's biography. We kind of get to learn about Daniel, and in learning about him, we learn things of discipline of his. He was a man of prayer. We learn that he trusted God in situations that were kind of on the hairy side, and he was faithful to stand for God and serve not only God, but he served those that he was put in authority over him. Um, and in doing so, he was in Babylon under captivity. He got to do some pretty crazy things and some cool things, but he got to really be a light for um, God in that time. We transitioned to the second half of the book. And we moved into the visions of Daniel, kind of the more the prophetic half of the book. And in the second half of the book, chapter 7 through 12, there's four visions that Daniel has. The first one being the vision of the four beasts, which we learned was about the different kingdoms that would be coming after the, Babylon, or the Babylonian kingdom and four kingdoms to come, leading up to God's kingdom, right? The ultimate kingdom, the one that can surpass everything. Uh, Chapter 8, we saw the vision of the ram and the goat and the man, where we saw a little bit more details to the Mede-Persian Empire and the um, Greece Empire, and also some foreshadowing of the Antichrist to come, which was kind of cool. The third vision that Daniel had, one that kind of bothered him, but it laid out the timeline of the 77s, the years that would take place for the, um, not the captivity that Daniel was in, but the years to come after that, also leading up to the final seven, the seven years of tribulation and that time. Then we jumped into chapter 10, 11 to 12, where we're going to be as looking at the final vision, this vision of end times. And last week we looked at chapter 10. We saw how Daniel begun this vision by fasting and praying because he was distressed over the things. His vision begins with an image that he gets to see of Christ, um, the pre-incarnated Christ. And we referenced that in showing in Revelation of how John described Jesus when he saw him um, in heaven. And we saw that it, the vision started with this image of Jesus, but then there was this angel that stepped in to give Daniel the vision. The, Dan, the vision that the angel tells Daniel at first is, he's like, hey, I want you to know, we see you've been praying. God knows you've been praying. He had an answer for you. He sent me right away, but there was this holdup that I got. And Daniel takes the opportunity, or Daniel learns, and the angel takes the opportunity to show Daniel that there's stuff that goes on behind the curtain, stuff that takes place in a spiritual realm of the good and the evil that's battling, and how this angel had a 21-day battle with a demon or a fallen angel, and it was a tough thing, and he had to call in backup, right, because he couldn't hang with it himself. So he called in Michael. Michael came in, battled. The angel um, here broke away. He came to tell Daniel the vision, he starts telling the vision. It kind of leads through the first part of a quick little picture of the first two kingdoms that were taking place, from the Babylonian kingdom to the Mede and the Persian kingdom, and what would take place with Alexander the Great, the third kingdom coming in. And then we jump into chapter 11. And chapter 11 is a chapter of controversy. And it's controversy because it's full of so much details and so much truth that it makes people wonder, did Daniel really write this? And if he did write it, how did he get all that information to be right? Because see, what Daniel does here in the angel transitions here is looking mainly at two of the um, parts of the third kingdom, the, um, the Greek kingdom, and what takes place in the downfall of that kingdom. And the information that's given into it is just mind-blowing because it's, it tells the true facts of what happened. And when you look at history, history confirms it which that makes it the controversy, because then they wondered, did someone write this at a later date and time after all this happened, so that way they could prove Daniel's case? But we know better, right? We know God is the author, and he's writing things, and he puts things out there, and sometimes he lets things go ahead to give us a picture so we understand, so that what? History can see it, and then when history goes to prove it, it doesn't just prove it, it proves 
God to be right, which is a great thing and something that we're going to see here in this chapter. So we're going to dive into the chapter. I titled the chapter or the lesson for tonight, The Rise and the Fall. We're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 5 through 45. It's a large section, but truly what we're going to see in this section is some great things that God is setting up and how he's going to show himself at work, even though man thinks they know what's going on. And as we've seen that theme already throughout Daniel, where man thinks they know, they have their plans, they have their victories, really God's in the background doing a work. And as we've kind of seen, we got the glimpse last um, in chapter 10 was when the angel showed that whole behind the scenes, the spiritual warfare, the things that are taking place, because truly God is doing and controlling everything. So here we go. Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 5. We pick up, we're going to read through verse 28, so we're going to look at one section, and then we'll check into the next section, but it's picking up in verse 5, it says, also the king of the south shall become strong as as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion, and at the end of some years they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority. And neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. But it says in verse 7, From the branch of her roots one shall rise in his place, who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. And he shall also carry the gods captive captive to Egypt, and their princes and their precious articles of gold and silver, and, he shall conti- and it shall continue more years than the king of the north. In verse 9 it says, Also the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, but he shall return to his own land. However, his son shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through, and he shall return to the fortress and stir up strife. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him. And the king of the north, who shall muster up a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. When he has taken away the multitude, taken away his multitude, his heart will be lifted up and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. The king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come to the end of some years with a great army with much equipment. And it says in verse 14, Now in those times many shall rise up against the king of the south also. Violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in the fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound and, and take a fortified city of the fortress of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall not have no strength to resist, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in in the glorious land with destruction in his power. He shall also set his face to enter within the strength of his whole kingdom, and the upright one with him, thus shall he do, and he shall be given the daughter of a woman to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him for be, or be for him. Verse 18 reads, After this he shall return his face to the coastlands and shall take many, but a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and the reproach removed he shall turn back on him. Then, it says in verse 19, he shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. In verse 20, it says, There shall arise in his place one who imposes tax on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, not in anger or in battle. And in his place shall arise a vile person, to whom they will not give honor or royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue with the force of a flood. They shall be swept away before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall cover up and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the providence, and he shall do what his fathers 
have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them and plunder, soil, spoil, and riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. In verse 25, we read, He shall stir up his powers and his courage against the king of the south, and when the great army and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will be at the appointed time. And verse 28 includes here with, While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. Whew, did you get all that? The first thing that we see here in this section, well, with this section we see is the struggle for power. The angel narrows down the prophetic vision here really to two kingdoms of the four remaining kingdoms that exist under the division of the Greek Empire after the death of Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great reigned, he took over large territories, but unfortunately he fell. We've learned that, right? And then he had four generals that kind of took over in their areas, and they had their different regions that we could see um, in doing so. We have Seleucus, which was the Syrian empire from Turkey to India. Um, Cassandra, which was over the Greece area or the Macedonia area. Lysanamush, I hope I say that right. Oh, well, he's not here to correct me. It was over the area between Greece and Turkey. And then we got Ptolemy, who ruled over Egypt. What we see in this passage is really the two guys that we have to focus on is the first and the last. They were the guys who built their empires, their dynasties, and in a sense would become strong. The kingdom of the south would become strong with its strength, it says, but so would the king of the north. And as it kind of shows, the other two kind of feathered out, but these two were the two that kind of, if we look to history, battled back and forth the most. History tells us the region of the south ruled by Ptolemy, ruled, he ruled Egypt from 306 to 284 BC for a large period of time. Seleucus I, who was over Syria, located to the north of Israel, reigned from 312 to 280 BC. So they reigned roughly about the same amount of time. They both wanted power because if you have power, you have control, right? They both wanted that. These generals, in a sense, they took their parts. They expanded, they grew, they did, but there was a problem between the two. You see, they wanted what each other had. But what laid in between each of these two was Israel. And for over the next kind of 300 years, Palame's family would rule in Egypt. Over the next 250 years, Seleucus' family would rule in the area of Syria. And in here we see that the angel continues to give this insight into these two families, these two regions, these two kingdoms. And in doing so, he kind of sets up an ancestral play-by-play -play of what's going to happen throughout the years. The battle is going to go back and forth between the north and the south. The feud that's going to last forever, longer than the McCoys and the Hatfields, is going to take place here. And there's going to be some things that are going to happen that definitely are going to be things that are going to be one for the history books. The king continues that apparently in doing this, this ancestry line, he's really showing not only what's taking place from here, but what's leading up to at the end of the, these dynasties and how it's going to point to the Antichrist and the man that we will see who is still yet to come. So this picture is large. It works through. This battle that lands between the north and the south reigns for about 130 years. Anyone want to go to war for that long? That's a long time. But, you know, it's family wars, and you know how families keep things going on, right? And truly, as it plays out each war, and each time uh, the north has the victory or the south has the victory, guess what they have control over? The land in the middle, Israel. So if the south, Egypt, is winning, they have Israel. If the north, Syria, is winning, they have control over Israel. So we're going to see here how the battles take place. We're also going to see how this is truly, and what God wants Daniel to understand, how this is going to affect Israel. 
So we look at it here as, the, as we see it play out and the things that take place. In chapter, uh, verse 6 of chapter 11, the angel skips forward a few years, as several years it says there, into a new generation that's reigning in both of these areas of the north and the south. And of course, after years of, drain, of fighting, what do you want to have? Peace. So the angel says there's going to be an alliance that's going to be formed. If we go to history, there was an alliance that was formed between the north and the south, and it was done in a kind of a soap opera kind of way, I'm going to say. Basically, the king of the south said, hey, I'll give my daughter to you, the king of the north, and that will form an alliance between the two of us where we can have peace. So the king of the north says, okay, but I got one problem. I'm already married. Well, you figure that out, says the king of the south. So the king of the north does what? Divorces his wife, kicks her to the curb, says, okay, bring in the new lady. He marries her, starts to have kids. Things go on pretty well. Life is peaceful. The trauma side of it, which is totally a soap opera, right? The father of the bride dies. What's that mean? Is there a need for a peace agreement anymore? Nope. So, Salius, or Salukis, basically decides to take his wife that he has right now and says, guess what? You're no longer my wife. You're now a concubine. Demotes her, brings in his ex-wife, remarries her, brings back the kids and everything like that, and says, life is great again. Guess what? The ex-wife wasn't happy. As history says, she killed her husband, and then she killed the wife that replaced her. Sad, right? Not only to top that off, it's total mafia style because she takes everybody out and then takes her one of her sons and puts him on the throne. So now we've got a new king, and we no longer have peace. We now have war that is taking place in the region, in the area. The angel also goes on to predict the idea that this wouldn't work. He kind of told Daniel, hey, they're going to have a plan to bring peace. It's not going to work. Man thought this would be the greatest plan. I'll give my daughter to this guy. We'll have an agreement. Guess what? Didn't work. Amazing how that works out, right? So by the time that some time passed with this, of course, with anything, what happens when you kill a f someone else's family member? Rage instills, right? Well, the South Kingdom is upset that their loved one's been killed, so they retaliate, and any retaliation done in rage and, and um, what's it when you want to get back at something? Revenge is never well, right? So he storms up through Israel, up to Syria, marches in, starts kicking butt and taking names, finds the, um, the ex-wife wife, Kills her. Says, yeah, I'm going to do one better than that. I'm not only going to kick everybody's butt. I'm going to take all your prized possessions, your idols and everything, and take them back with me to Egypt. Transports everything back down as he goes back through Israel. Do, 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 do. South is in control. They're ruling. Time passes. About 50 years pass. And the king of the south, an Egyptian king named Temea Philadelphus, the king of, um, and the king of the north at this time, um, Sayokis, also called himself Antiochus Theos, which means Antiochus the God. Anytime you give your name when it's got the God in it or the great in it, we should all be worried. They come along, and of course, as history tells us, of course, they start to have trouble again. They start to fight. Of course, you know, you take my stuff, I want it back, right? So history tells us that they fought things out, things went back and forth, they would fight. It didn't go so well, and everything gets mixed up. The angel tells us in verse 7 of the chapter that he continues to say that things are going to get even crazier as they go on. Over this, south will have the win. They will have the control, but it will only be for a time. And the angel here is focusing on the fact of the battles that are taking place that, yes, Israel's not involved in those battles, but it's going to affect Israel. Because what happens when an army comes through? especially in that day and time. If they wanted something, what'd they do? You know, if they needed more supplies, they would take stuff. And if, an, if they get beat, right, say the south travels to the north and they get beat, what are they going to do? When they go back, it's not like you just pass through, right? You've got to kick the dog on the way back, right? So then you've got to harass Israel and vice versa, either way that it goes. So from this time forward, there's a seesaw of battles taking place, victories between the two kingdoms that bring death, they bring power struggles, and the crazy thing is Israel's stuck in the middle, and they have nothing to do about it. They just sit there. They kind of take it, and they go, oh, great, here comes the south again. Oh, look, they're returning. Oh, they didn't win. That stinks. Oh, look, here comes the north. They're on a rampage. Yay. Oh, look, they won. Maybe they'll be nice to us this time. 
didn't play out, right? As we jump down to verse 11, we read that Egypt was, at this point in time, take victory over Syria, which would result in the northern kingdom would rise up with pride, take as many lives as they could in battle, but yet not be triumphant. They wouldn't have victory. They wouldn't have the win. They battled hard, but they didn't get to claim the victory. And as both sides went to their homes, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom would divide, they would rebuild and do. But the problem was, here's what the revived happened in this verse. As the north went up and kicked butt, and the, or the south went up and they kicked butt, the north didn't quite win. They decided to do something that would be great, right? What happens when you're not losing? What do you call? Timeout, right? We didn't call timeout, but they called truce. And they advised this truth plan that would just make great. And unfortunately, when you're kind of high on excitement of winning, do you read the fine detail in the little print? No, you just won, right? Who, no one told you that you had to pay taxes on that win, right? Well, the whole thing here was is they got, the north would be left alone to do what it wanted to do. They wouldn't take the army. They wouldn't do anything with the stuff. So the south basically goes back empty-handed. Why? I don't know. Bad deal, right? The north takes the next 14 years to regroup. They get their military in order. They get their uh, weapons in order. They get everything to go so they can do stuff. Well, as the, it goes on in history tells us, the Egyptian, king, uh, or the Egyptian king passes, and the family has to put someone in the spot. They put a five-year-old in control. I don't know. Have you seen a house ran by a five-year-old? I don't know whose idea this was, but they put a five-year-old in the spot. Unfortunately, he had advisors running the show for him. Probably a good thing. Don't know. The king of the north decides at this time, I'm going to sit back and let's see how this plays out. You put, they put the five-year-old in control. The advisors start doing things. It causes an uprising rebellion of the Egyptians because they're like, this is ridiculous, right? Well, at the same point in time, not only did the Egyptians revolt, there was Israelites still living in Egypt that decided, hey, we're going to jump on this bandwagon too because they were a little bit rebellious. We haven't done anything. Let's join in the fight against Egypt. Maybe something good will come of it, right? Who knows? Well, of course, Antiochus is up in um, the north, and he decides, he's now Antiochus the Great. Again, if you got the name title, right? Antiochus the Great has an opportunity here. Their own people are fighting against them, so guess what? I'm going to go down and take siege. This is smart. So he trumps down through Israel. He gets ready to take siege. As he comes up closer to what's going on, and he does these things, and he thinks this would be a great to come in and defeat Israel because of what's going on. He doesn't understand what the king and the... Um, not so much the king, but the advisors had done, they signed up with the Romans because there's a new kid on the block. He's a little bit bigger. He's starting to make a name for himself. And if a five-year-old's running the house, you've got to have somebody smarter in control with that, right? So they tag up with the Romans. So Antiochus the Great comes in, and he thinks this is going to be cakewalk, holds into town and goes, wait, there's Romans. Hold up, stop. So what he does is he has a battle in the area. He claims a victory of one of the fortresses, the strong cities in um, Sidron. The army comes in to fight. He captures the army, and he disgraces them. And what I mean by disgraces them, simply enough, he beats them, takes all their clothes, and sends them home naked. Bummer for them, right? But then he realizes, I can't take Egypt because they got Rome. Man. So he looks back up, and he kind of wonders, and at this point, he decides he's going to head back up to home because he can't really do what he wants to do. And in verse 16, we read that the angel told Daniel that Antiochus the Great would not be pleased. No one would be strong enough to stop him. He would settle down in the glorious land and be strong enough to destroy it. But he didn't because of the Jews. And he didn't. And the reason was because of the Jews that rebelled. So it kind of paid off for those Jews that rebelled against Egypt. It bought him a safe spot when Antiochus decided he couldn't do what he wanted to because he went and made his camp in Israel. And he had the power to destroy Israel but he decided to be kind at this moment and not be a total tyrant. So we see that the Egyptians are weak. He knew it. He was unable to attack because of this mutual aid contract they signed with the Romans. And now, what is he to do? He can't evade Egypt, so he stays in Israel. We get a flash here, kind of looking to the future. During the time of tribulation, the Antichrist will invade the glorious land. It will invade, he will invade Israel. And he's going to use it as his base of operations to attack the other nations. 
And this will happen after he receives the power from Satan. So after the halfway point, when he goes in and does the abomination and desolation, and he gets control, Israel's now his new control center. And from that control center, he's going to attack the other nations, much like Antiochus the Great did. He used it as his home. And he deceived, and he came in and did it. And as John says that the people will say this in the end times, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, and this is the CSB version, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against it? The Antichrist will be seen as strong. Antiochus the, or Antiochus the Great was seen as strong. Antiochus the Great feared Rome, the up-and-coming new kid on the block. So he set up a peace treaty with Egypt because he decided if I can't beat him, I might as well be at peace with them because I don't want Rome coming after me. And in doing so, he decides I'm also going to do another thing. I think some families did this back in the day, but I'm not sure. I'm going to offer my daughter as a wife to the king. Now, mind you, the king's only like seven years old. He's got a nine-year-old daughter, and he's like, all right, this will be a great peace treaty. I'll give my daughter as a peace treaty. I'll have an inside scoop because she's seven or nine. She'll listen to me, and she has that Syrian background, so this will be great. I'll be able to take it over from the inside. This failed him too. Not as bad as the first time. What happened was she goes down there, and she actually falls in love with the guy. What happens when you fall in love with the guy? You forget about dad, which is what she did. And she was faithful and loving to her husband, and guess what? There was no inside serious trading going on. She fell for him. It went. At that point, Antiochus the Great is totally upset. He's enraged. He knows that he can't do anything. He can't attack the kingdom or do anything that way. So what would be good? Go back home. But he can't go home empty-handed, right? So he sets his sight on the coastlines, and he decides he's going to go and attack some of the cities there and at least have some victory. Because some victory is better than no victory, right? Well, as he rolls into the towns, guess what he notices? They're occupied by the Romans, which is terrible news for him because he doesn't want to go against the Romans. Now he's pretty much the last guy standing who's not controlled by Rome. And in this opportunity... Rome sees that they've been squeezing him enough. So Rome puts the squeeze on him. And they basically say to him, you know what, why don't you just come under us? There's nothing else better for you. But when you come under us, guess what? Because it's been a hassle and you've been taking so long, you've got to pay some taxes and some fines and some back due stuff, and they hit him hard. So hard that the scripture tells us that he died as a result of it. You know why he died? He couldn't pay the fees. The bookie showed up, and guess what? No pay, no life. He dies. What happens next for Antiochus' family? His son inherits the debt. Isn't that a great thing to walk into? You finally get the kingdom. Oh, it comes with a lien? Dang it. He walks into it. Rome comes at him a few days later. What are you going to do? He says, well, I can't do much, man. My people are devastated. They're taxed to death. I don't have any money for you. The scripture says that he doesn't die because of anger, and he doesn't die because of battle. You know what they did to him? He couldn't pay, so they put him in prison. What a way to die. And thank you, Dad, for that one, right? After this, the scripture tells us that one's going to come in that's even more vile than what has been there before in the passage we read. And he's going to take the throne. Well, the next guy that comes in, he's not an heir. He's not of lineage. He got power. He got might. And he steps in and he takes the throne from the people. And what we see here playing out in this fulfillment, going through, is this vile person comes. His anger is vent on Jerusalem, and he's shaken. He doesn't know what to do. And we see in verses 20 through 27 that the angel told Daniel that after a brief reign of the former king, the next king would be a vile king. They wouldn't recognize him, but yet he would have the power that he needs to step in. He does things that truly are not great. He would attempt this covenant with the kingdom of the south, but it wouldn't go anywhere. There'd be a great battle, but no one would win. And in doing so, he would want to return, and he returned up, and he takes place in Jerusalem. It's already been shaken. It's already been rocked by everything that Antiochus and the family has done, of replacing the high priests, persecuting the people, and conforming them to the Greek culture, moving them away from their faith and their traditions, he comes into town. All this happens as the angel predicts to Daniel 
And the details of the evil is always sustained because of the root. It's rooted in following our own will, not God's will. See, God alone is sustained and enduring, and in him alone, all things come to truth. Which is why when Paul wrote Romans 8.28, he was able to say, And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. What Daniel was given here so far was to understand that God is working, and he's doing something. It may seem off to the people in the situation, but he is in control of it. So let's see what takes place here in the second half of the chapter as we read verses 29 through 45. And picking up in verse 29 of chapter 11, it says, The appointed time he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. And he shall return and show regard to those who forsook the holy covenant. Wait. He shall return and show regard to those who forsook the holy covenant and force shall be mustered by him that they shall defile the sanctuary fortress and they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place their abomination desolation those who do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt with flattery but the people who know their god shall be strong and carry out great exploits and those of the people who understand shall instruct many yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame but captivity and by captivity and plundering now it says in verse 34, When they fall, they shall be aid with a little help. But many shall join with them by intrigue, and some of those of the understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the, end, time, till the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. The king shall do according to his own will. He shall seek exact, seek, he shall exactly exalt. I'm with it. It's okay. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. He shall reign, regard, he shall regard neither the god of his fathers, nor the desires of women, nor any god. He shall exalt himself above all, but in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor it with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortress with a foreign God, and he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. And in verse 40 we read, At the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from the land, Edom, Moab, and the um, prominent people of Anaman. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries in the land of Egypt, shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasuries of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt, also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels, but the news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with very great fury to destroy the inhabitants and inhabitant many, and he shall plant in the tent of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountains. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. What we see here is the sinister acts. We read that Antiochus in his anger was defeated and returned home, but along the way he stopped to vent his frustrations, which just so happened to be on the people of Israel. Of course, you're not going to vent your anger on the people of your homeland, right? So you've got to do it before you get there so you look peaceful. So he's in Israel, and he wreaks havoc on the nation. He used the soldiers in order to, lead, um, to follow out his despicable work. The soldiers of Antiochus drew their swords and they promised the people if they didn't follow the Holy Covenant that they would give them gold and silver and life. But any that decided to stay with those covenants and not forsake it, they immediately were beaten, imprisoned, or faced death. 
The soldiers were sent out with orders like this, kill any woman who's bo- had their boy circumcised and compel every Jew to um, sacrifice to Zeus. So basically, if someone followed the law, simply even the law of following circumcision, have them killed. And if, they don't, if that's good or they want to bow out, as long as they follow Zeus, we'll be okay. Pretty messed up, right? Not only did he do there, and that, the regular ceremonies and sacrifices that took in the temple were stopped because he had an altar of Zeus played on, placed over the altar of God, defiling the temple and making it so they became desolate and no one wanted to go into it. The temple became closed at that point because there was no reason for the Jews to go to it. And sadly, many Jewish people gave in to the pressures instead of facing persecution because Antioch has showed favor to those that forsook the Holy Covenant. So over the idea of bowing down or standing up, they feared. And they chose to not stand, but to sit simply in the side and to hide. But it tells us there that there were some that took a stand in verse 35. Some of those of understanding shall fall or be refined, purify them, and make them white. So there was a group of guys that basically stood up. If we look to history, we can see that this is the Maccabees and they're a kind of revolt of it. There was five, uh, their father and then the five brothers that come in. They fought, and they fought hard, and they fought over different things, and they stood. They lost some battles. They took on some defeats, but yet they were still able to reclaim the temple and to clean it up and to withstand it. They had great exploits, and it intrigued people to come along with them. And verse 35 concludes saying, until the end of time, because it's still for the appointed time, Antiochus still had a reign. God has still allowed him to be for a short time, but he had a short loose, a noose around him. He was only allowed to do so much, so many battles, so much persecution, but he had a timer set. The angel explained to Daniel that the king would blasphemy God, he would exalt himself, the wrath would be accomplished, and it would be determined, this was already to be determined and to be done. God would allow it. And he is allowing this for what? For Israel to understand where they need to stand and how to stand in these times. The angel explained to Daniel that this king would also pass and another king would come in, and this would be Antiochus Epiphanes, that shows us truly that all sinners oppose God. And he remained loyal to his Greek religion and traditions that he held to. Just because we know something doesn't always mean that it's the right thing to be following. But he followed hard with it. And we can see that as this king, this king came in, it was important that he's a preview of what is to come. Though he did these terrible, evil things, They were nothing compared to what is to come with the Antichrist. The Antichrist is kind of going to do even more devastating things. So we have the prequel that we see here with history that's laying way to the feature show that is still to come. The stage is still being set for it. We know that everything about this prophecy was not fulfilled during this reign. Jesus specifically said this, about the real abomination of desolation that was still to come in the future when he says in Matthew 24, 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Understanding that there is still one to come. This that's happening is nothing compared to what is going to happen. Meanwhile, the Antichrist will do much more damage, but remember, he too is on a short leash. He can only do what God has planned, what God has purposed to be accomplished. The passage closes out with the angel describing to Daniel an alliance between the kingdoms of the great leaders and with a battle near the Holy Land. There's details in which there's a victory, but before the celebration takes place, there's news of someone from the east and the north that's coming in that's going to basically win. It says there that the, the Antichrist shall plant his tents on the pal- in his palace between the seas of the glorious holy mountains and between the seas and the holiest glory mountain. This describes an area that between the Mediterranean Sea and the holy mountains known as um, Megiddo or the Valley of Megiddo. We know this from Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, when it says, So they assembled the kings at the place 
called in Hebrew Armageddon, which is also the Megiddo Valley, the final battle that's going to take place. This future battle between God, the forces of evil, led by the Antichrist, that will happen towards the end of the tribulation, when the angels pour out the sixth judgment seal, and Christ returns to claim victory, to start the process of setting up his kingdom on earth. Daniel chapter 11 is crazy insane. It's packed with so much truth that we can see, truly we can see that it did happen the way that God said it would happen, but it also points to things yet to come, which brings us to our so what. So what do we do with all this? Things can get hairy. Things are kind of scary right now, would you agree? And we read the certain things taking place. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we trust God to prevail? That was what the picture that was painted here for Israel was to trust God that God would prevail. The encouragement that we have is to trust God that he will prevail. But often in this life, it looks like the enemy's winning. It looks as if the problems are just keep coming and keep going and no matter what takes place, the enemy is winning. And what we see from our point of view, unfortunately, is the enemy's winning. How could this be right? The other problem we have stepped into is a place of one that we can change a change on our own individual letter, level. But the problem with that is we don't get enough victories. So what are we faced with? Discouragement and anguish. And we wonder, come on, God, what are you going to do? And God's sitting back. He already knows. I have stuff going on. You have to trust me. You have to know I will prevail. The thing that we have to do is we have to come to terms that we are not in charge. God is in charge and is working to things to move for his glory. To do this, we have to learn to surrender to God and his will. And to do this, we have to stop fighting against reality, against him and his plan. We have to stop insisting that we know what would be best and what should happen or what should be done differently. We have to stop throwing our inner child, inner tenor, ta inter little child, tenor, tantrums. Little child tantrums. We're not five-year-old kings ruling the area, right? We have to drop our frustration, close our eyes, take a deep breath, and choose to believe that God will prevail. And if we believe that and we trust that, we can sit back and we can see where God is doing his work. And he truly is showing up in big ways. But how do we get to a place of that? Well, there's some things that we got to keep in check. So I'm going to give you a few ways that you can ask or you can see in your life what doing is whose will are we leaning towards? And we can ask ourselves, am I willing to let God prevail in my life? Yes or no? Am I willing to let God be the most important influence in my life? Yes or no? By the way, the only options for answers for these questions is yes or no, okay? And it's not a um, sure baby, yes no, okay? The third one, will I allow God's words, his commands, and his covenants to influence what I do each day? Yes or no? Building on with that, will I allow God's voice to take priority over any other? Yes or no? Am I willing to let whatever God needs me to do take precedence over any other ambition? Yes or no? And lastly, am I willing to have my will swallowed up in his, yes or no. I want you to know this. When it comes to these questions, you can't answer all of five of them yes and one of them no. You can't answer three yes and three no. It has to be all yes. And if you can answer all of them yes, you can see that you're leaning towards God's will, and you will see that God's will is prevailing over our will. Which brings us to a thing that we can look back to that we can see and we can agree then when we look at all the stuff going on, we can understand that God is at work and we can hold true to the truths that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that those who love God, we know that, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who called according to his purpose. And truly, we can see that God is prevailing even though everything else could look like it's falling apart, it's falling into the place that he would have it be. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, 
I pray for each of my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself that you would just continue to show us the areas to stand strong, the areas where we need to relinquish our will and lean more into your will, Lord, so that we can see your truths, your world coming together as you give us this glimpse behind the curtain, Lord, where we can see the rise and fall, that we can know that truly you are on the rise and on the throne in each and every one of our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.